How do you find the will to fight back against a world that wants to keep you sedated, average, and stuck in place? Join us for the tools and strategies you need to create a life of abundance, discipline, and high achievement. This, this, is, this is the Tactical Empire with Jeff Smith. Guys, welcome to another edition of the Tactical Empire. Today, I am pleased to announce and introduce our guest for the day, Mr. John Ply. He is the author of You Can Be the Best, Life Lessons from the Butcher and the Businessman. And just talking to him for five minutes offline has set me on fire. So I am excited for the next 45 minutes to an hour to... Uh, kind of delve into some of your knowledge, John. Tell me a little bit about, um, first of all, your business career and uh, like how how you got started. And obviously the, the name of the book is very catching, The Butcher to the Businessman. Please piece that together for us. Okay. Well, The Butcher is my father, okay? And his life is beyond extraordinary. I consider him the most successful person I've ever met. And in the book, I really go down what is truly the definition of success. Um, and um, his story um, is one of the reasons I wrote the book. Okay. I wrote the book to inspire other people to dream big. But I also wanted to leave a legacy for my father, who I felt deserves a legacy for what he went through. At a very young age, I started my first company at age 25. The prime rate was 21%. I got thrown out of every bank I went into. And I was running out of time. I needed to come up with some money. I needed $60,000. Or no, pardon me, I needed $30,000. My parents, who were poor, loaned me their entire life savings at the time, which was $15,000. And one bank, one bank loaned me the other 15 at two over prime, 21 plus two, 23%. And back then, $15,000 was a lot of money to me. Yes. <clears throat> Started um, tiny little company, service company to the food industry. And uh, started with one Hispanic helper. And we were blending powdered food products into industrial side pa packages. My prior business life right out of school is how I learned this business. Oh, yeah. Um, a little okay. bit of background. I started caddying when I was in eighth grade to pay my way to high school. Okay. My parents could not afford my high school. And a friend of mine said, John, why don't you come caddy? You can make good money. I did. It paid my way to high school. And after my junior year, I learned about a scholarship called the Chick Evans Scholarship given to caddies, boys and girls. I applied. I got the scholarship. Went to Indiana University, studied finance. Thought I would be a banker because my best friend's father was a banker. And I used to caddy for him all the time. He had a great life. Belonged to two country clubs, a big, beautiful house. Loved his life. I said, heck, I'm going to be a banker, right? So I graduated. I was getting married right out of college, and I couldn't find a job in the banking industry. A mentor of mine said, why don't you write letters to all the country club members with a resume? And he wanted me to handwrite them. I did about 50 of these handwritten letters, which you can imagine what it takes to write 50 perfect handwritten letters, because if you have a scratch out or a misspelling, yeah. you got to start over, right? Yes. <laughs> so I did that. And sure enough, when I got to the letter L's, a man by the name of George Lauritsen said, hey, come on up. We might have something for you. So I took, I went up there, saw what they were doing. They were blending and packaging. A lot of people don't understand that a lot of the food companies don't make their own product. They hire contract manufacturing companies. At the time, they were doing a ton of business. In fact, 95% of their business was with, was with Pillsbury. And I saw this situation. I said, you know what? I need a job. 
I took an inventory control position. Wasn't even sure what that was. <laughs> but my boss said, the reason you want to work here is we give raises on performance, not how long you're here, and you will learn everything there is to know about running a business. I said, I'm in. One year later, Pillsbury and my company that I worked at got in a big disagreement. You know the old proverbial, win the battle, lose the war? Yep. My company won the battle, lost, lost the, war. the war. Yeah. Pillsbury paid us a big chunk, chunk of money. And then two weeks later, trucks showed up and everything was taken out of the building. We had nothing. All the employees got laid off. My boss got fired. I thought I was going to lose my job. George Lauritsen came to me and he said, John, I'm going to teach you how to sell and we're going to save this company. So Jeff, over the next two and a half to three years, I learned. And I was so successful at it that I went from inventory control to production control to assistant vice president to vice president to president before I was 24 years old. And he made me all kinds of promises. I remember in one of your pods, you talk about honesty. Yeah. A lot, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I have a, I have a chapter in my book. It's called Be Honest. All right. Well, my boss lied to me. He made me promises and didn't keep them. Hence, one day, he embarrassed me as president of the company, and I got up and left with no idea what else to do. And of course, my timing wasn't great. Most companies were going out of business because of the interest rates. And here I want to start. And here I want to start one. You know what? You do what you got to do. I begged, borrowed, whatever. I came up at the last minute, got that one loan from a bank. My parents had faith in me. And I started this tiny little company. And slowly but surely, I built it. One blender, eventually a second blender. I'll give you a great banking story. The bank that loaned me that money, talk about being a partner and honest and whatever. I went in after 18 months. I owed them $11,000. I paid the interest and principal down to 11000 And I went in asking for one over prime. They said, sorry, we can't give it to you. And, uh, and then I noticed they had put a 17% floor in the paperwork for my renewal note. And I asked this loan officer, I said, Chris, does this 17% floor mean what I think it means? That no matter how low prime goes, I'm gonna be stuck paying 17%? And she said, yes. Yeah. And I said, that's unfair. I was paying 2% over prime with no ceiling and they put a floor on my note. And I told them, I said, hey, I would be forever forever loyal to you for giving me that loan when I needed it. But I'll have to go find another bank. Well, that was the dumbest decision of a bank in the history of banking. <laughs> they told me to go find another bank for $11,000, Jeff. Yeah. I found another bank at one over prime. Okay. I can't even begin to tell you how many millions of dollars I have loaned over the years. So many, I've lost track. Yep. <laughs> Borrowed a lot of money, built two companies, built buildings, and they let me go for $11,000. Okay. So um, that's how I got into the food, powder, blending, and packaging. It's the only thing I knew. Okay. So I started small. The goal can't be the biggest, but we can be the best. I built my contract manufacturing company over the next 10, 11, 12 years to be about four times larger than the company I worked at from scratch. Love it. I love that. But here I ran into a huge problem that most companies would love to kind of have, but it's not a good problem. I actually was so good. At, we were so good at what we did, but it was a very low, low margin, Jeff. And I had just built a big, beautiful custom facility to uh, consolidate under one building. And 
We had so much business, we couldn't keep up with all the clients. And when I asked for price increases, that I'd always get, oh, no, you can't raise our prices. You know, we'll go, we'll go somewhere else. And being still a relatively still young entrepreneur at about age 36, 7, um, finally I said to myself, you know what, we're going to be in trouble. I got to do something else. And I said, I'm making them rich. Why don't I start a product company to be a customer of my first, right? Mm -hmm. That was the idea. Some people thought I was nuts. Nobody in contract manufacturing had ever done that. They could never get themselves out of contract manufacturing. Well, I hired a product developer, went to my banker, said, his name was Fred Alford. I said, Fred, I need to borrow $250,000 personally because I'm starting a new company. And, if, and I explained what I was going to do. I said, if, if I pull this off, you're going to have two good customers instead of one. Well, the first year, Jeff, I paid this product developer uh, $60,000, $25 an hour. And I sold exactly $0 of product the first year. And people told me, my, my confidence, my VP, my accountant, John, this isn't working. We should just figure out how to, you know, fix this situation. Sure. We were becoming inefficient. We couldn't finish orders. We had so much business. And it's all low margin business. So our low margin was shrinking. But I said, I'm not giving up. This is our future. The next year, I didn't sell much, not enough to even get rid of one client, replace one client. I sold $220,000 worth of business, Jeff. Do, have I called you Chris a couple times? No. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, make a long story short, Jeff, 220000 in sales. The next year, a million eight. The next, million, the next year, four. The next year, $15 million in sales which happened to be one of the saddest moments in my business career because we were doing, people are like, oh my God, you just grew to 15 million in sales, right? My accountant came in one day and said, John, you need to go borrow a million dollars. We owe the internal revenue service based on our profits. We don't have the cash. Yeah. Can you imagine writing, going and borrowing a million dollars and then signing over the check to the IRS? Because on paper, we had made over $3 million on that $15 million. Right. But it was all tied up in receivables, inventory, whatever. Sure. But for the young entrepreneurs out there, this is reality of owning your own company. I solved the problem, Jeff. You know how I solved it? We grew to $33 million the next year. And we turned our inventory several times. I never had a cash flow problem for the rest of my life. Sure, that's awesome. continued on, continued on. When we hit 45 million in sales after eight years, I had fired all 120 of my service clients. And that's where I got proof that the first company achieved the goal of being the best. Because yeah. as we were firing them, Jeff, they were begging me to keep them. There's nobody out there like you guys. You're the best. You're the best. We'll even pay you more. Jeff, I was making about 15 cents a case when I made their product, and I was making about 350 a case when I was making my own. Profit. No brainer. No, no brainer. brainer, right? <laughs> my plant, my equipment, my employees, they don't know the difference, right? Right. He doesn't know, to know the difference. And um, all the way to the end, they begged, 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 begged. All right. I continued to grow that company along with the help, not just me. Sure. You know, my, my, my team was amazing. Um, I think about your, your uh, podcast where you talked about honesty, about being honest, not just when it's convenient, right? Right. Well, I have a chapter in my book because for 35 straight years, I was honest always with my clients, with my employees, and with my suppliers. That's how we became the best at what we did. And you cannot fail once because you, as you talk about, 
Your reputation, your character, your credibility can be ruined. One lie could ruin what you built. And so when I made a promise, I kept all my promises to the employees. And I finally grew that business. We grew that business. We grew that business to almost 90 million in sales when I sold it off. And the proof that the second company achieved the goal, the company that bought us paid us an exorbitant uh, uh, EBITDA. And, uh, but we had the best clients. We were, by the way, I didn't tell you what that second company ended up doing. We became one of the largest suppliers of cappuccino and hot chocolate in the country. Okay. So if you go into any 7-Eleven, any Quick Trip, Wawa Sheets, uh, Casey's General Stores, you put a, push the button for French vanilla cappuccino and hot chocolate, my powders were in those machines. Gotcha. How cool is that, right? Awesome. How's that little entrepreneurial story for you? <laughs> or two. <laughs> or three. <laughs> Well, I mean, it sounds like you you found opportunities along the way each time and you filled the vacuum in, in each case um, and, and you kind of started where you're talented. I see that happen a lot of times. I mean, I live in Texas. You, you see that a, a lot of times in like the midstream energy providing companies. They see a gap and an opportunity, whether it's in shipping and distribution or manufacturing or anything like that. And they're like, you know, and it's it's so funny that that escapes people because they get they get wrapped their head wrapped around like that could never work. And I have seen company after company after company carve out fifty million dollar niche, hundred million dollar niche. I'm like, how much do you need? You don't have to create Amazon, like. <laughs> You're absolutely right. You don't. I live a. You saw where I'm sitting right now in my home in Palm Desert, right. California. You go, holy crap! This guy had to, you know, caddy to pay his way to high school. Right. No. You're right. You don't have to. And you know what? Those are ex exceptions to the real, real life. There are only so many Amazons and Apples and whatever that have been built. But companies like mine whatever the industry, it's sort of the old proverbial, just build the better mousetrap, you yep, know, yep. just make it better than everybody else. So when I mentor anyone, I don't care what your industry is in, or if I'm talking to people on entrepreneurism, there is only one goal. Just do what you're doing with a goal of becoming the best at it. Everything else will take care of itself. John, can I ask you a question? What sure. do you think what do you think led to your seemingly consistent exponential growth? Because I mean what you described to me was three million to eight million to fifteen million to thirty four million to yep. ninety five million. And and you're eight years down the road still doubling. Like what what do you think led to that? <clears throat> Jeff, it's 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 setting the goal. It is setting the goal, but the goal of becoming the best at anything, if you're in it, if you're in your business, you don't ever really sit there and think about where am I? What you do, and this is what causes the success, is every single year you, you, you meet with your team and we analyze the previous year. And then we plan for the next year, what can we do better? Mm -hmm. it's, you, you just continually strive to improve whatever product, service, business you have. What can we be to, or do to be better so our competition has no chance of catching us, right? We did that. We, had, we used some analytics. We had customer service um, percentages. We had obsolescence uh where we reduced our obsolescence every single year which drops to the bottom line and when you yep. make more and and jeff when you make more money guess what you can do you can buy more equipment you can hire better people you can build a better facility whatever it is as long as you're striving and you're and then once you are along that path i i, I mean this is almost i love telling this story I had, I had or competition that gave up, mm -hmm. you know, 7-Eleven's back in your, your, your home state, you know, that's where they are.
we had them no matter what. Even when they he would say to us, oh, we're going to put your business out for a bid. You know what that was? They just wanted a, a price decrease. They were right. never, they never left our clients. But I literally had competition that said, I'm not going to Casey's. As long as Insight Beverages have it, we aren't getting it. You know, that kind of thing. And that's just from just layering it on. Keep, what can we do to get better? How do you get better? We, we just look at every part of our business. And don't leave a stone unturned. Just keep trying every year to be a little better. And you wake up one day and you go, holy crap. I didn't realize, Jeff, we became the best in both of those industries during the time I did it. Yep. It's only in the last few years I was reflecting back and I go, holy cow. I did it not just once. I did it twice. Yeah. We, I, I always sometimes say I. I started them. But no company becomes great without your team of great employees of sure. acquiring great customers. I talk about it in my book, the, uh, the three-legged stool, whatever you want to call it. You need all three. You need to take care of your customers. That's a given. We all, that's easy to do. You must take care of your employees. You must yeah. reward them on a regular basis. They don't have the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow that an owner might have. So they got to be motivated and rewarded on a regular basis. Lastly, the piece of the, the stool that companies forget and they don't do it. And that's why they're never great. You must take care of your suppliers. Without great suppliers, I can't have the best company. I need great suppliers. So when you take care of your suppliers, your employees, and your customers, sky's the limit. You can't fail, really. You just can't. It's impossible. You, you just can't fail. Because everyone will jump through the hoops, and the customers will see the effect, and they're like, they're going nowhere. So, um, yeah, it's... It's, it's not that complicated of a formula, really. But doing it is another thing. Here's a little tidbit for you. You don't have a whole bunch of employees, I don't think, in your business. I did get upwards of over 250 employees, right? Yes. 70% of them were unskilled. Many of them were Hispanics. Jeff, I knew every one of their names. And of all 250 employees in 35 years, I never once said someone worked for me. They worked with me. It means a ton. That's all part of building greatness. Yeah. No ego. You need them. They need, we need each other. And we have to be on the same page. But this idea, anytime I hear someone say, oh, I got 40 people working for you, or I got 200 people under me, or whatever the hell they say. Yeah. It's so condescending to the, to the people. You know, I work with these folks. And in my book, one of the gentlemen who made the book is a gentleman by the name of Alfonso Acevedo. He's kind of the poster child, modern day poster child, uh, similar to my father's upbringing and life. But Alfonso came to my company when he was 17 years old. He did not speak English. Alfonso just retired. He and his wife, who we met at my company, he just re retired a few years at age 57 or 58. They both retired from working at my little company. Hey, they worked there longer than me yeah. because they worked there uh, after I sold it for another six, seven years. They worked there. <laughs> um, but Alfonso, he learned every job. He learned to speak English and he grew himself all the way to where he was one of our managers and had a well over six figure income and. And um, retired. I love that. Don't you love it? Yeah. yeah. And Alfonso, yeah. by the way, Alfonso and I, I think he got the bug for golf through me. He and I play golf two, three times every summer. I love that. That's awesome. How about that? <laughs> um, that's so interesting that you were able to keep up that level of cadence of growth and optimization and like pushing for improvement and improved greatness over such a long period of time do you think that that was part of the culture that you built or 
I, I mean, it sounds like it had to have been. I see companies all the time peter out around year seven, eight, nine, and they're making good money, and then they just status quo it, and they think they're going to ride it out for the next 10 years, and they're going to make the same amount of money. It's kind of the theory that if you're not growing, you're dying in business. And like if you're not constantly pushing to evolve and iterate, and improve, then then you're going backwards. Yes. Uh, Jeff, culture, it was definitely a culture. And oh. that culture starts at the top. Yep. Okay. And so your leader, your owner, your, you know, I was an employee is the way I always viewed my position as an employee. I set that culture. Okay. And that means being honest every single day. Yep. And feeling for your, knowing what your employees were doing every day, how hard they worked. Because you have to remember, Chris, I had a huge advantage. I did every one of the jobs. Right. <laughs> when you start from scratch, you drive the forklift. You yep. type up the bill of lading. I dumped the powders into the mixer. I got filthy dirty with blending cocoa powder and all that stuff. And I had to clean the machines. And we had to keep, you know, everything. When you do it all, you, 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 I know what they're doing. I know I was there. I did it myself, and I knew how hard it was. So you have that appreciation for all your employees. Um, and um, so, yeah, it's definitely a culture. And um, my, my, well, it's funny you brought that up because I would have customers. I'd give tours of the, with client, new potential clients. We'd finish a tour, and you know what they'd say to me? They'd say, wow, why do all your employees seem so happy? <laughs> you know, and there's some of them are, not, those are not glamorous jobs, some yeah. of them, right? But they're smiling. You know what? Part of it's the culture. I go out and say, hey, hey good morning, Alfonso. Good morning, Maria. Good morning, Francisco. Good morning, Alejandra, right? Yeah. It's all part of that. When you, I would go sit and have lunch with them, sit in their lunchroom and eat sure. with them. They're like, who is this guy, right? He's sitting with us, right? So that is culture. And then the ultimate compliment, the ultimate compliment. I cannot tell you how many suppliers, you know, we all have suppliers in our business. They would come. We treated them like customers. That was our motto. Even the suppliers got treated the same. And I can't tell you how many times they would say, John, your company is our favorite company to call on. That's a supplier talking. Right. So it is certainly a culture has a lot to do with it. What did you enjoy doing um, outside of growing businesses for 40 years? Um, you know, I just, I was, I was an athlete my whole life. Um, passion for basketball. There's a great story in my book about, trying out for Indiana University's basketball team when I was there, uh, when Bob Knight, when Bobby yeah. Knight was there. And, um, you know, I didn't make it, but um, there were 37 of us. And um, I got down to the last day after two weeks of cuts, there were eight of us left. They cut us all. But um, that year they went 31 and one and the next year 32 and zero. All right. Yeah. And I had no regrets. My regret would have been if I didn't try, all right, because basketball was my passion. After college, golf became my passion. And I still, to this day, I'm still chasing that little ball, trying to be better, be a better golfer all the time. So I love that. And I've been doing a lot, a fair, not a lot, because mentoring takes a tremendous amount of time. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've had some tremendous success with some mentorships which I think is all also part of giving back, you know, and my book, you know, I never thought of it this way, but my book is a readable mentorship to success. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I have, I, you know what, here's another thing. Um, you know, sometimes you hear about people who sell their business and then their life is over. Right. My wife and I always say we're the busiest unemployed people on the planet. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You got to have some other passions. 
one of my chapters in the book is pursue your passion. Um, golf's a passion of mine. I love it. The people I've met, the, what it's given me is unbelievable what it's given to me in my life. And it's, of all the sports, I've played them all. It's the hardest one. Sure. It, is the, it is the hardest one. So, um, so yeah, we just stay busy. It's great to be able to have the freedom to do things when you want to do them without, you know, worrying about, you know, can, do we have time? Can we afford it? All that kind of stuff. Those are the benefits of working hard to build your company or career. Yeah, certainly. Certainly. Um, so tell me, tell me about the mentoring you're doing. Cause like, that's something I'm passionate about as well. Um, so how did you get into that and who are you mentoring these days? Well, well um, you know, it's funny. Um, I didn't think of myself as a mentor necessarily through most of my life, but I've had, there, there's a couple stories in the book of people who considered me a mentor when I was like just five, four years older than them. Sure. In high school. And, um, and, and there's another story about a Navy SEAL who I convinced him that he should pursue his passion to become a, a SEAL uh, rather than become a doctor. That story is in the book. And his parents did not want him to be a SEAL. But uh, Jeff, my good friend Jeff, he still calls me and I've sort of been his mentor. But the biggest one of all, Jeff, is... I met a young lady three and a half years ago hitting golf balls at a club in California, just the two of us. I'm watching her hit balls and I go, OMG, I've never seen a woman hit a ball better than her. Her name was Lilia. And I said, after a while, I'm an engager. I talk about that in my book. Don't be afraid to engage with strangers. They might become your best friend. You don't know. Um, Finally, I engaged with her. I learned her story, Jeff. Holy cow. Two years before I met her, she graduated from UCLA as the number one woman amateur in the world. In the world. She went out the next year onto the LPGA, and for all practical purposes, she crashed and burned. Just didn't work out for her. And... I met her the next year was the COVID year and that whole golf season was broken up in pieces. Yeah. She didn't play well. And so you have to go with what back then to get your LPGA card, you would go through the uh, Symmetra tour. It's like the ladies corn Ferry tour to now it's called the Epson tour, but back then it was the Symmetra tour. And if you do well on the Symmetra tour, the top 10 women, get a card to go back to the LPGA or go to the LPGA. In her case, go back. Um, so I said to her, and I don't even know why I said it, but I just said it. I said, Lily, I don't know if you'd be willing to do this. I just knew there was something. She was, she was really down. She mm -hmm. was mentally down, sad. And I said, I don't know if you're willing to work with me, but I think if you would be, I can help you achieve your golf dreams and more. Jeff, she said, yes. Here's a stranger, yeah. a golf lover, of course. She said, yes. I spent the next over six months with her, getting her ready for the next season's Symmetra Tour. And she got so many of the lessons that are in this book. So she had a, Let's just say her outlook was totally different on life, on success, on hardship before she went out to try to get her card back. She won three times, eight top tens. She graduated number one from the Symmetra Tour. Now, they don't pay a lot on the Symmetra Tour. She won $162,000 with three wins and eight top tens. Those are small purses. Yeah. But more importantly, she got full status for next year on the LPGA, which was last year, 2022. And her first year on the LPGA, she had a very successful year, except she did not win. 
So she was disappointed because that was one of her goals was to win. Sure. But Jeff, without a win, she won nine hundred nineteen thousand dollars. Not bad. Not bad. And brought and brought her world ranking from maybe two thousand down to forty one in the world. All right. That's incredible. I'll stop before I tell you what happened this year because I want to give you one of the goals that we when we talked before she went out to the Sumatra, we were going one day we were talking about goals. And I said to her, I said, Lilia, your goal is not to get back to the LPGA. She looked at me like, what are you talking about? Like I had three heads or something, right? Sure. Because that was her only goal. Yeah. I want to get back to the LPGA. She said, what are you talking about, John? That's my only goal. I said, Lillian, no, that's not the goal. The goal is to become the best player on the LPGA. Now, that's a longer term goal. Right. Right? Yeah. It's going to be filled with a lot of ups and downs. But you can't. That's the goal. Now, you may not get there, but that's got to be your goal. And she went silent for like five or six seconds and her eyes got big and she, it dawned on me and it dawned on her. She had never thought about becoming the best player on the LPGA. Right. Yeah. And all of a sudden it turned into more of an excitement in her eyes. Like, Holy cow. I never thought of that. Right. Right. So we'll move into this year. Lilia Vu is her last name. Vu. She just finished her season. Four wins, two major tournaments, over three and a half million dollars. She's the number one player in the world. John, how are you going to leave that out? You were like going to cut off the podcast and like, hey, see you later. And yeah. like, oh, let me. Hey, <laughs> Jeff, Jeff, I, yes, I edited and revised my book. Because of what she's done. I had to, after she became number one back in September, I'm mm -hmm. like, I can't let the, the reader know that she, you know, is 41 in the world and made 919,000. I got to let the reader know what you can do, what is possible. Mm -hmm. That's why this is called, you can be the best, Right. Yes. Because you can, because Lilia did, following the lessons in this book. That's a crazy story of mentorship, right? Yeah. I mean, but, but you imparted on her an expansive thought process. Because if her goal was only to qualify, she may or may not have ever obtained her card. Well, or if, she, if her only goal was to get there... You know how many right. PGA pros and LPGA pros get to tour and then fall off a year later and they struggle right. to get back? They get back and they fall off again? you got to have the other goal. One of the lessons, huge lessons in this book, all right, that she had before she went to Symmetra, and this lesson came as a result of my father. This lesson, how many times have we all been told never give up? You've heard it a million times, right? You tell your own kids, never give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. The chapter in my book is never give up no matter what. Those last three words, Jeff, are more important than the first three. No matter what. If my father, by the way, his name is Zygmunt Plivacheski. That was my name, too, before it was shortened after my first birthday to Ply. Ply, okay. My dad was captured. He was in the Polish army at 18, captured by the Germans when he was 19, and was a prisoner of war for the next five and a half years in the German camp. Five and a half years doing what you're told, anything, just to stay alive. Yeah. Many Prisoners were not kept alive. They were shot because they either didn't work as hard as like my dad, Ziggy. He goes by Ziggy and he's the butcher, by the way. Yep. And, and I shared that with Lilia. Lilia, never give up 
no matter what, because out on on the tour, shit's going to happen, right? Yeah. 100%. If my father gave up Jeff for just five minutes, I would not be alive because he may not have made it. He then worked in Germany for the U.S. Army after the war for 58 months. He came here to America at age 30, and he didn't speak much English at all with a name like Zygmunt Plibachewski. But he worked hard. And he was a butcher for the next 35 years. Two jobs, cutting meat, working in a freezer. I did it for uh, Christmas break one year in college. Trust me, I sure didn't want to do that for the rest of my life. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But that guy, and again, you got to read my book because his story makes me look like a pauper. I can never become as, as successful as he did because he achieved things that only it takes a lot to get to where he got to the, what I call the ultimate level of success. He got there. And it's not about dollars. Yeah. People who think success is about dollars, they're missing. They're not, you know, that's not it. There's lots of people with lots of money, but they're not necessarily successful. Right. Yeah. yeah. John, I am dying to read this book. All right. <laughs> Sold. That, we, we just took so many turns there. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so are you going to be a high-performance athlete performance coach now? You know, um, are you familiar with Todd Herman? Have you ever heard that name? No. Todd is a, a very, very successful performance coach who he, he was uh, Kobe Bryant's uh, one of his performance coaches and uh, a bunch of other star athletes. He he really cut his teeth uh, mentoring Olympians on mindset and how to not like psych themselves out because sure, they've only sure. got one opportunity. Uh, but, but he came from sports into business and now he trains executives and things like that. I see you going the other way. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? As much as it's, it's very, it's very fulfilling to mentor. I like to mentor younger people, of course, because they have their whole life ahead of them. Yeah. Okay. I had mentors. Uh, and they made a couple of them made their, their they've been recognized in the book. In fact, three of them have been met, mentioned in my book for various reasons. Um, I feel at this stage of my life, first of all, mentoring is incredibly time consuming if you're going to do it well. OK, it's a huge commitment. And I then forced the mentee to be committed to, yeah. as I call it. Hey, getting on the ply train is easy to get on. But you may not want to stay on the fly train and you're welcome to get off anytime you want. And it will not affect our friendship or relationship, but you're welcome to get off if it gets too hard because it's not an easy train ride. Um, because I will be brutally honest and point out the things that maybe you're, you're lacking in or what you need to do. And so, but I feel, uh, Jeff, my calling more is, um, as my book gets traction, I hope to be getting speaking engagements, maybe at high school and college level, to get these, to be able to get some more, more young people and get them to understand a little bit, get a better idea of what's out there, what the potential is. I always tell people, you know, give me an 18 year old, I'll trade my home, my cars, my life, everything to be 18 again. Because yeah. the, the journey is so fantastic. It's not easy, but I'd love, I'd love to do it again. And, you know, and I don't know what it would be, maybe a little bit different than blending powders, you know, and drink, creating cappuccino and hot chocolate and cookie mix and whatever. Um, but um, I think it's not to be doing a ton of mentoring, very selective mentoring. Sure. More about doing stuff like, sharing with you and your listeners um, my story to hope, hopefully inspire them. Yeah. You know, um, because sometimes that's all people need is some inspiration that hits home and they go, because, you know, I always tell people when you read my book, after you read my father's story, 
you won't feel sorry for yourself anymore. Sure. When, when people feel sorry for themselves, how are they going to get anywhere? Right? A lot of people feel sorry for themselves. Oh, man, I was born in a bad home or whatever. Okay? You're not going to, you know, you got to lift yourself up. Yeah. And anyone can do it. My father's the poster child. He is the poster child of true success. And that's about where did you start and where did you get to? Where was the starting line for you? And what did you have to overcome? There's a lot of the definition of success. Yeah. Um, so my goal is to really, well, hopefully I have several years left. I want to touch as many lives as possible to inspire them to, to greatness, right? Become the best. I you can do that. it. You, you really can do it. You know, your goal is what you do, Jeff, should be simple. Have the best show out there. Work to have the best one. It doesn't we're, matter. We're working on it. We're trying to impact the most lives we can. John, right. where can people find you besides buying your book? You can be the yep. best. Where yep. can where can they find you? Where can they buy the book first? Anywhere? First of all, it's anywhere now. Okay. It's all over and it's in all it's all in, in in every version. There's digital, there's hardcover, softcover, there's even the audio. I did the audio. However, I'm going to because I made significant um, some significant updates to the book. I haven't had I haven't been able to get studio time yet to redo the audio, but okay. you can get it pretty much anywhere. You can communicate. You can go to my website. You could be the best dot com. Okay. I have a personal email that that's John Ply at you can be the best dot com. If someone wants to talk to me or leave me a message and say, hey, ask me a question, whatever. Um you know, I think it'd be great to communicate with some people with, with, through, through the, those vehicles. And, um, um, yeah, so that's the best way to find me these days. It's taking up a good chunk of my life these days, but I want to give it my best. I want to give it my best, Jeff, over the next year or so to, to really, that's why I'm going to do virtually any podcast that comes up. Okay. Because I think to me, getting to your listeners I'm hopefully going to touch them and then hopefully the book gets recommended from one person to another. Cause that's what scribe told me. They said this day and age books are sold through word of mouth and yeah. social media and yep. right. hundred so, percent. You know, so this is all new to me. And like I said, I don't do this to make money. I, and this is any, any profits from this book. And I'll tell you, it's going to have to sell a lot of books based on, the small commission they give you on a book, you know, yeah. <laughs> but it's okay because it's not about that at all. Other than I love giving money to charity. I do it a lot. It's one of my favorite pastimes is helping people in need. Um, but that's how they can get a hold of me and, 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 and find the book. Okay. I love it, man. I love it. You're an inspiration, John, for sure. I will be reading your book very soon. Um, <laughs> Guys, go check out John's book, You Can Be the Best, Life Lessons from the Butcher and the Businessman. John, thank you for your time. I'm going to send you a message, okay, offline. And I, I would love to connect and keep in touch. Um, I run a couple different business masterminds uh, that I would probably like to introduce you to. You may be able to provide value in there for us too because um, you, I'm sure, are – a man full of stories and we oh can God. go. <laughs> there's, there's so many, Jeff. It's again, but you'll have your own 20 years from now too. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure too. Thanks for having me, Jeff.